Good morning, everybody. Um, this event, I would say, is less academic than the rest of the events that we are doing here through this summer school and was uh, basically initiated by the institute, by the directorship of the Institute of Advanced Studies, partly for public relation purposes. Uh, we hope that it will have an effect. Uh, this event will going to be uh, um, uh, published uh, uh, in, in the media and newspapers. Um, and we decided to, for this event to carry out a, a, a short discussion, a panel, on the topic, uh, are we safe? The uh, global financial crisis and the risk of its return, okay? And um, the way we are going to, uh, to deal with it, I hope, uh, is that uh, several people in the audience, but if there are other people uh, who wish to ask, to, uh, to, uh, ask questions, uh, are very welcome to do it, uh, but several, uh, several other people, if, you know, if it's going to be a silent here, there will be people who will ask questions. If there is going to be a silent on your side of the table, then I'm going to uh, address questions. Um, and uh, the question will address to the panel, and the panel will uh, try to deal with it, okay? Stan, in fact, Stan, uh, Stan Fisher was supposed to be here today. I got the call from him uh, early this morning. He apologized that he had something very urgent that prevented him from coming. He will come later, and he, he will give his talk at 6 o'clock uh, this afternoon. Okay. And, and, uh, <laughs> Eitan Shishinsky, Eitan Shishinsky, got only five minutes notice that he's on this panel and all the, you, you should forgive all the nonsense that he's going to say, <laughs> therefore. <laughs> okay, I want to start with, with the questions just to have things uh, warm up a little bit. Uh, if, you, if you follow uh, most of the media reaction to the crisis, most arguments that come up uh, in the media about the source of the crisis uh, were based on uh, the argument of irrationality. People are irrational, people uh, don't understand the market correctly, people are acting based on emotions, based on instincts, based on reflex, and, uh, and that's why we have crises. And uh, what, the question that I want to uh, addressed to the panel uh, is how much of this uh, basic message is true. Now, if you want to estimate it, well, what percentage of this is true and what percentage is, can, it, can be attributed either to the failing of the mechanisms or just to something that we cannot prevent because let's say there are multiple equilibria and there, you know you can be with a very good mechanism, you can be in, in some good equilibrium as well in some bad equilibrium. Eric, take me. Well, first of all, I, I think there were two popular explanations. Uh, th there's the, 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 the explanation that people are fools. There's also the explanation that, that uh, people are rogues. So, so there, there, there were these rapacious bankers and other financial people who uh, uh, were interested uh, in robbing the unsophisticated, uh, lo looting the bank, uh, as, uh, as Larry Summers put it last week. Uh, certainly, that there was plenty of irrationality to go around, and there was a certain amount of uh, rapacious behavior. But uh, as this summer school has emphasized, there were some very conventional uh, reasons rooted in, in good economic theory for what happened. That uh, financial markets, unlike other markets, uh, have uh, an inbuilt 
externality, or uh, unlike many other markets, not, not all other markets. Uh, that, that is, uh, as, as we've seen uh, from, from many lectures over the, the, the past week, uh, one financial institution's behavior has important implications, uh, not just for its own well-being, for its own profit, for, but for uh, the, the well-being of other financial institutions. So if, if my bank gets into trouble, that's not just a problem for me, but it's also a problem for, for your bank. And that's not an externality that I take into account. I don't internalize it. And therefore, there is going to be a, a tendency for a variety of reasons for banks to assume too much risk for the good of the system and uh, to be too highly leveraged for the good of the system. Uh, th this is true even if people are entirely rational and even if people are behaving according to the rules. Uh, if, if there's irrationality and rule breaking on top of that, it, it, it only makes it worse. But there's a problem even, uh, even if all the conventional assumptions are satisfied. And, and this suggests that uh, in order to have a safe financial system, uh, there is an important role for regulation. Uh, regulation did not, in, in my view, uh, do its job uh, in preventing this crisis or in uh, at least uh, ameliorating the crisis. And I hope that next time around we can do better from a, from a regulatory perspective. Uh, yes, I, I, I agree with what Eric said, but uh, I think the key, the key question really is why now? You know, we have had uh, about 60, 70 years without crisis in the U.S., and suddenly it comes as, for that reason, among others, as an enormous surprise. I think it's safe to say that most economists 10 years ago would have said we are never going to have a panic of the order of magnitude, roughly as the Great Depression, though it hasn't yet come that far. Uh, by the way, no, we are not safe. Uh, and, and so the question is, you know, what, what, on, what possibly could have changed? So these explanations about externalities that Eric mentioned are just not sufficient because they have always been there. And so you, you got to look at something that has significantly changed. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that suddenly Wall Street was populated by crooks and rogues. Did you say rogues or? Uh, rogues, right? uh, rogues is the pronunciation. But, but, but and, was, yeah. But this was not the first crisis in, in, in 60 years. There, there was the uh, SNL crisis. Yeah, there the have been. There was the Asian crisis in the 90s. Yeah, the Asian there crisis was, was not. the dot com bust at the end of the 90s. Yes, that wasn't the crisis. So let me explain what I mean by a crisis is somewhere where the system is significantly under threat. And that, that the, the, you know, which is what has happened now, you know, massive injections that, that, that the government has to put in. And by the way, we are not safe. It may be that we are. Two years from now, we are really talking about the Great Depression. That's a perfectly possible. Nothing like it was ever, you know, conceivable. The SNL crisis was very localized and handled in its own way. Uh, I would say the LT, you know, long-term capital management had the potential to spread, and people were nervous, but there never was any. I mean, it cost nothing basically, and it was saved easily in the end. And, uh, of course, the really significant marker is that we had a huge dot-com crisis, but it had, it had zero effect on banking. It, it didn't in the least threaten our banking system, which is one of the pieces of evidence that's uh, important here, is to understand that, uh, you know, you have a crisis in the stock market of that order, and it doesn't cause a crisis 
in the banking system, that's an inst interesting piece of evidence. Asian crisis, of course, not in the U. I, I was talking in the U.S. So I think so. What is it that has changed? And it's it's pretty clear. It's a, it's an enormous rise in the shadow banking system. You know, the shadow banking system, which was there always, you know, for a long time. Uh, basically exploded and became bigger than the traditional banking system. And, and so with a, let me just, I'm speaking about this this afternoon, I just want to say that the problem is that uh, deposit insurance worked beautifully in the traditional banking system. And there isn't a deposit insurance in the shadow banking system. It's uh, more like an interbank system where there is no insurance. and. I think we are really struggling. You know, Europe is struggling, the US is struggling with, uh, with the question about having insurance in shadow banking. And it's, a, it's basically an open hole in the boat. And that's why we are not safe. What, what's the word insurance and what? Insur deposit insurance. Deposit insurance. Okay. Yeah. There is no, uh, we are talking about such huge you know, the unit of deposits in the shadow banking system are in the hundreds of millions. Some, some you know, single trades are basically a billion dollars. So these are gigantic, uh, you know, movements of money. And uh, I think this is, uh, in my view, uh, the source. That's a, that's a proximate source. So one has to go deeper into the question of why it rose, and, and I won't do that here. But uh, I see the shadow banking, obviously, as the problem. Um, well, I agree, as Bank did, with much that's been said. Uh, I, I'd put it, though, slightly differently. To me, I think the crisis we're facing, uh, as I said over and over again in my lectures, is the result of a leverage cycle. And I think these repeat themselves over and over again. They just got worse this time. And the shadow banking system is a part of the leverage cycle, but it's only half of it. And there's another part, which is in housing. And the two together is what caused the problem. So by leverage cycle, I mean, when people think of a loan, traditionally they talk about the interest rate. That's all anybody seems to have talked about for 50 years, 70 years, the interest rate. The Federal Reserve jobs in America and the ECB's job in Europe is to manage the interest rate. But anybody who takes out a loan realizes that there's something else, which is the leverage or the collateral, if you have a $100 house, can you borrow $80 on it or $90 on it or $40 on it? So that second number, it's called the leverage uh, or the loan to value, let's call it loan to value, it's simpler to think about. That loan to value is in my view a more important number than the interest rate, although our regulatory bodies never paid attention to it. So the theory is very simple, when leverage goes up, prices go up, when leverage comes crashing down, prices come crashing down. It's a number that we've never monitored before, uh, even though it's had a huge impact and has caused several of these Asian crises and things before. So um, the two, so Bank asked what, what uh, changed. There were people who realized that housing prices were soaring up and Schiller, my colleague at Yale, was the first one to really call attention to it and to say it's a great bubble. But he, he, he attributed it to irrationality, exactly what we were asked about. Um, but he never thought to think what else might be going on under, underneath. And so I helped collect the data on, the data is available, but nobody looked at it before. What is the loan to value on all the homes in America? So it turns out if you ignore the government loans, which were pretty much fixed at 20% down payment, and you look at uh, the non-government loans, and you look at the median halfway through, you get uh, 14 or 15 percent in 2000, and then 2.7 percent by 2006. So the down payment was almost disappearing. People could hardly put any money down. The loan to value was up to over 97 percent, and they could buy a house. Naturally, housing prices soared. And in the repo market, um, the same thing was happening. The amount that an uh, investment bank had to put down to buy a security was getting lower and lower during that time. Now, uh, so I think it's leverage went up, prices went up, leverage went down, prices uh, went down. So why is it that leverage goes up? Well, there are several reasons. One, the most important is volatility uh, stays low. 
So curiously, our very success in controlling problems which made volatility low actually gave an incentive for people to take more and more leverage to, you know, the lenders were less worried so they'd lend on easier and easier terms. That was one thing that happened. Second thing is an un, uh, unappreciated, I think, dynamic in the economy is that collateral is scarce. And so innovation will always look for a way to stretch the collateral. So the, the securitization boom in America, which is behind the repo business, that uh, boom was an effort to stretch the available collateral. So it increased leverage tremendously. The third thing was that housing leverage. I mean, people just, the lenders got bolder and bolder. They wrote contracts that would have been unimaginable 30 years uh, before. So we had this huge increase in the repo market, leverage on securities. At the same time, we had a huge increase in leverage on houses. And of course, the two interact with each other. And so that's why leverage went up. Why did it suddenly go down? It's because once we started to get some bad news and things were so leveraged, people got nervous and the lenders seeing the bad news and, and uncertainty increasing, they were suddenly unwilling to make the same kinds of loans. And so people couldn't refinance their mortgages, they couldn't buy new houses. Uh, and, and I think that's what suddenly drove pricing down. One more thing, uh, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say, is that at the end of the leverage cycle, when people have borrowed a tremendous amount using assets as collateral and the prices go down, that leaves people underwater. They owe more money than their assets are worth. I never appreciated myself uh, 10 years ago how much behavior changes when you owe more than your assets are worth. No one's gonna fix their house if they are gonna get it taken away from them in two years anyway. Nobody's gonna lend money to somebody to fix their house if the lender thinks the guy's gonna lose it in two years anyway. So a business has the same problem. There are so many businesses that are underwater and so many homeowners that are underwater in America that it paralyzes productivity. And so I think that's the end of a big leverage cycle. You're gonna find lots of people underwater. Now we have lots of sovereign countries underwater. And when that happens, their behavior changes, their productivity goes down, and the problem get worse and worse. The only way out of these problems is to find the right way to forgive some of the debt. It's not the borrowers. It's, so in the choice between rogue lenders, as uh, Eric put it, and these irrational, unscrupulous uh, borrowers who borrowed way beyond their means, where do I see the blame lying? I, I, I see the lenders should bear some of the responsibilities for it, and we have to forgive some of the debts. In, for homeowners in America, if some of the debts are forgiven, the lenders are gonna be better off in the long run, as well as the borrowers, and the country will be much better off. So the leverage cycle made things go up, the collapse in leverage contributed to things going down, and at the bottom, you get everybody, a lot of people underwater, and you have to start thinking of radical uh, methods of solving the problem, namely forgiving principles. So we're not safe, because we haven't done anything to prevent this cycle from recurring, which has happened over and over again. And by the way, as Banks said, this cycle isn't over. He said, we haven't seen it yet. There's still all these people underwater. There's still many parts of the world getting worse. And uh, we haven't actually come out of this crisis, much less done anything to prevent another one. Thank you. Um, you heard the Yal's uh, uh, explanation. I was called in five minutes ago, Stan. I'm no gross substitute for Stan Fisher either. I'm much less than a gross substitute. Uh, and also, I'm an outsider, unlike my good friends. Uh, at best, I'm a client of these banks. But let me say, nevertheless, some words. Um, the first point I wanted to make is that is, is perhaps related to what John just said. It's the capitalization of banks. I want to talk about the in, in general. I want to focus on the structural issues that were revealed during the recent crisis. I think the capitalization of banks went down. In other words, or in the, the other side of the coin, the riskiness of banks went up dramatically. Uh, why it was, we can talk about rationality, we can talk about the incentives of managers, short-run incentives versus long-term incentives, package pays, and so forth and so on. The fact remains, capitalization of banks has gone down. Now, I look at, and there are suggestions, and people have realized that, and I think there is a consensus that this was inadequate, and this was a major cause, and they want to change it. Now, I look at the, I, all, all this is just for reading, I'm not, and, and I read about what Basel III uh, has, is proposing, 
And I see that they propose to distinguish between banks who are could cause systemic risks, large banks who can cause systemic risks, and other banks. I think this, I haven't seen a precise definition. I think it will be very difficult to have this kind of all input, output, the whole chain, and, and to have measures of, uh, uh, I don't think size itself is, is itself a measure. Larry Summers talked about that. So I'm, I, the, my first point is capitalization of banks for whatever the reason has been inadequate. And I think the proposals by, of Basel III for the banks, all of them are for increasing the capitalization of banks, are uh, uh, distinguishing having a two-tier bank is, I think, is problematic, but maybe it's the best kind of thing that we have at this point. The, uh, and, and, and that relates to what also was talked about in, in Larry's lecture about too big to fail. I think we have now, um, uh, uh, in fact, there's more concentration now after the financial crisis than it was before, having all the banks, the failure of various banks. Uh, if you look now at measures of concentration, the banking industry is much more concentrated now after the, the crisis than before. I think a major issue is the issue of the investment banks and regular banks. Now, I'm not make, making anything new. This was, uh, basically I'm talking about the change that was, that happened in the 90s um, on repealing the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act that was separated, that created investment banks and regular deposit banks was repealed by, among others, uh, Larry Summers, who was at that time, and Rubin, who was the uh, Secretary of the Treasury at that time. Uh, and um, I think any kind of Chinese walls between regular banking and investment bankings ends up in a Chinese dinner. Uh, there is the only way, the, the only, the, the, the the, the only way to come, the only way to do it is to separate, to go back, to separate investment banking. Ba investment banks are speculative by nature. Deposit banks who serve the clients are, are not, have different objectives and different constraints. And I think the separation, reestablishing a separation, I'm not the first one to say it, I can hang on very tall trees like Paul Volcker and many others, Mervyn King and others, who are talking about going back to the separation of investment banking and regular banking. And so in other words, investment banks should raise their own capital from the public. And this will be known, that this, the, the riskiness of that capital will be known, and that is the only the, the way to go, to my mind, is making this, com coming back to that separation. The, the, the final point I want to talk about, and it's related to that, is the regulation. And, and clearly the regulation was inadequate. And, and bank, ba chief CEOs said they didn't know what happened inside and so forth. But what happened on top of that was, is the, the ring fence of the, of the, I'm talking about the financial sector. Regulating banks is inadequate, as we found out. AIG fell not because of its insurance business. AIG fell because it started doing other things. It did credit swaps. It did other things. It went into other business. And that what was the root cause. Absolutely. They're still good in, business, in, in insurance. They're the leading, perhaps the leading insurance firm in the world. That once they went into the mortgage and to, and to credit swaps and so forth, into all these other uh, uh, um, uh, instruments, financial instruments, that was the beginning of the downfall of AIG. And similarly, now coming back to Israel too, the regulation of banking, when you see a tighter regulation of banking, you see other firms, in particular insurance companies, coming into and replacing them in providing credit. The regulation cannot separate, therefore, those two. These are related markets. These are related instruments, uh, uh, institutions. And therefore, the regulation should, there should be an umbrella regulation that covers these sectors together. You, you, you regulate one, there will be a, the, the economic waters will find their way into, other, into the other uh, institutions. That has to be taken into account. And that includes also 
regulating additional instruments, financial instruments, which have not been regulated. I think <laughs> the, the audience and uh, I, as a friend of Larry, were, were, were very polite. Uh, Larry was, of course, instrumental in the 90s in excluding derivatives from the regulation. Uh, those who saw the Inside Job movie, you saw that there was a testimony about the phone call that the lady, I forget her name, who was the... Beckley Bourne, who, when she got the call from Rubin and Larry Summers saying we will not allow derivatives to be regulated. And so anyway, that's, I think if we would ask Larry today, he will admit that that was not um, good a good move. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Indeed. I try how to be polite about something like that. It's, it's difficult. Anyway, I'm, I'm ending here. I said there were some structural issues. We can talk about causes, but I think the, the regulation, I'm sorry, capitalization, the systemic risks, Basel III, the separation, very important, the separation, possible separation of investment banking from regular banking, a la Volcker and many others, Mervyn King and many others, academics included, uh, who offered that. Now, uh, some kind of, uh, and, and then the regulatory instruments. Thank you, Bob. Well, um, uh, thank you, Eitan, for a 10-minute speech about something that you thought about for five minutes. Okay, I really don't know very much about economics and finance and things like that. Um, uh, but but I, I, I did learn something about the crisis. Uh, upstairs uh, in the uh, Center for the Study of Rationality, there was in the fall of 08, I think it was in November of 08, there was a, um, a uh, round table discussion of the uh, financial crisis shortly after, a month or two after Lehman Brothers fell. By the way, Lehman Brothers is, is an investment bank, I think, or was an, in, was an investment bank, yes, and not a regular bank, okay. So uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, a month or two after that, there, there was this, this um, round table in which uh, Eugene Kandel, uh, who I think was supposed to be here today, right? No, no, no. Eugene Kandel uh, was a, a, a member of the, um, is a member of the Center for Rationality, and he is now the chief economic advisor of the Prime Minister of Israel. Um, and he spoke, and uh, uh, Professor Naiman, I believe, you were in the round table, right? And they explained it to me, and I, I thought I understood it. So, so uh, 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 let me first give the answer to to the question that uh, um, Eyal asked: uh, Was there irrationality over here? Um, so, so the answer is no, no, absolutely no irrationality, uh, zero percent irrationality, and also. Uh, uh, 0.1 percent, perhaps, of, of, of uh, roguishness, crime, uh, yeah. that also was not involved. And I think you, we, we have the center for rationality upstairs, and, and we have to realize what the definition of rationality is, and that is that a person is rational if he does the best he can for himself, uh, given the information that he has. Yeah. That's the definition of rationality. And if everybody is highly, completely rational, that doesn't mean that the system won't crash, yes? Are, everybody can be perfectly rational, not you know, crazy or, 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 or uh, uh, foolish or something like that. And the system can still crash, and, and we know that from game theory. I mean, we have the prisoner's dilemma where everybody is rational and the system crashes, right? So, so it, I mean, this is game theory zero zero one, yes, and and also economics zero zero one. It's the same thing. E economics is a part of game theory. So. Uh, <laughs> 
So, uh, 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 so uh, excuse me? Supply don't know anything about economics. <laughs> no, because I specialize in other areas of game theory. Yes, okay. Yes. All right. Uh, so, uh, so let me explain uh, what happened over there, and, and I think uh, uh, there are many intersections with, with what, uh, what happened uh, before. Uh, and that, the, what started this crisis off, and nobody mentioned this word yet up to now, but it was the subprime lending crisis, yes. And the subprime lending crisis got this going. And how did the subprime lending crisis work? It was a very, very good idea. There were people who, uh, who um, would not, uh, in the ordinary course of events, get loans to buy a house because they were not able to show a good pay slip or a steady source of income or something like that. And they would, they would be denied loans in spite of the fact that, say, the loan officer would have a, in the bank would have a, maybe an 80% 80, 80 probability that this man would uh, pay off his mortgage, but there was the 20% the remaining was too large, so, so he, he was turned down. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then somebody got a bright idea. Let's take all these people who are being refused loans for buying houses and bundle them together and see what the losses will be from the defaults. And after all, when you default, you get the house back, right? It's not so bad for the bank. At the most, you're, in the most you, get, you take the mortgage back. Huh? So what happens when, when uh, uh, so we figure out what the losses are. You charge a higher interest rate. Okay, you bundle all these together, and uh, and you go ahead, and everybody's happy. The bank is happy, the the lenders are happy. Uh, the world is better off. It's a win-win situation. It sounds like a great idea. Who knows something? Who can say what's wrong with this? Who who knows what's wrong with this? Here in the room, on the panel, what's wrong with it? Nobody knows. Okay, I didn't know either. Yeah, the banks didn't know either. They weren't irrational. Okay, so what was wrong with it? I'll tell you what was wrong with it. This, uh, suddenly a whole big number of people are getting loans for houses who did not get loans before, right? So this creates a tremendous demand for housing, yeah? And the, the contractors jump in and, uh, and build houses, okay? So they build houses and these people buy the houses who just got the loans, but 20% of them are going to default, right? They're going to default. Now, when those people default, yeah, the bank takes back the houses, right? That was all, up to now, everything is in a go according to the scenario, okay? The bank takes back the houses. Now, when the bank takes back the houses, what do they do? They burn the houses, they bulldoze them, yeah? No, they put them on the market. Now, the prices went up, yeah? The prices went up. And and uh, and now, the 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 um, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, all these houses come on the market, so the prices come back down. Okay, so somebody who who, uh, who uh, bought a house now, the houses that were worth say half a million dollars are now worth uh, four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, the person, the people who could pay back were able to pay back, not those that were, they paid $450,000 for the house, okay? They paid $450,000, now the house is worth $400,000, yeah? Who's gonna pay off a loan for $450,000 for, a, for a, a property that's worth $400,000, yeah? You have to be irrational for that, right? That's, so if you're rational, then you say to the bank, take the house. Take it, yeah? here are the keys. Take back the house, I'm not paying $450,000 for something that's worth 400,000. So even more houses come on the market, okay? So the price goes down to 350,000. You know, it's elementary economics, yeah? The law of supply and demand. The prices go down, so even more people default on purpose, yeah? We're not talking only about the people. So the whole market, crashes. So, so these banks that lent the money, yeah, 
the banks that lent the money are not able to, they, they are, they, they rupt, right? The banks rupt, they go bankrupt, okay? So, uh, um, and this is what happened, and what made things worse. This is what was explained, it sounded logical to me uh, three years ago, it still sounds logical now, okay? What happened, uh, uh, um, uh, in addition to that, what happened, just like uh, um, I think Eitan was saying, the, these people were not only, AIG was not only selling life insurance or car insurance, they were selling insurance on, these, on this paper, on, on the, the loans that people had taken, yeah? So, uh, so, AIG was saddled with all these loans that, uh, that were uh, unpayable, that people had defaulted on, yeah? And people had been selling, they'd been making these CDSs, credit default swaps, uh, to each other. So a whole bunch of different banks were involved in this, and the whole system crashed, but there was no irrationality in this. The only irrationality, perhaps, you might call it irrationality, but I don't think it's irrational, yes? The only irrationality was that this cycle, which we understand very well now, that, uh, uh, that um, the prices would, that there would be a tremendous new demand for houses, and that the prices would therefore go up, and then the defaults would bring the prices down again. This was not foreseen, but that's not irrationality. I mean, it's a mistake, yeah. It's a mistake, like Hitler made in not, in not crossing the channel after Dunkirk, yeah. It was a mistake, uh, but that's, it's not irrational, okay. Uh, it, was, it was a mistake in foresight, all right. But this can happen to, this, I, I don't think this is irrational. Everybody thought that he was promoting his own good, that people didn't figure these things out to the end. This, this certainly is something uh, um, that uh, can happen. And, and the underlying reasons are indeed leverage, but not the kind of leverage that, uh, who was discussing leverage? John, yeah, it's not just the leverage on the house, yeah, which was one of the things that, 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 that brought this down, because, you see, if, if, you, if there would have been a reasonable down payment on the house, right, uh, then, uh, then people would not have done this extra default, yeah, the, the people would not, if they would have had to pay a down payment of 20% and not 5% or 0% or minus 5% even, yeah, then, uh, then uh, uh, this would not have happened because the people who uh, had to pay back uh, 450000 for a $400,000 house, they, 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 they just would have had to pay back 350000 or whatever. Yeah. So the leverage of the individual is important, but what's, even, what's just as important is the bank's leverage. Yes, many of these banks, uh, I forgot their names now, uh, but they, they had leverages of, of 60 or 70 percent. In other words, they were lending out, uh, no, leverage factors. They were lending out 60 or 70 times more than their assets and their deposits, yeah? This is much too high a, a leverage, and, and this is what brought the thing about. As far as regulation is concerned, let me say this. We have had, since the Second World War, a tremendous prosperity, an unheard of prosperity in the Western world. Yeah. This prosperity was brought about by operation of the market. Uh, and and the, 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 the Eastern world, China, Vietnam, these people who are still communists, yes, they realize that, that uh, uh, the market brings about this prosperity. You bring in regulation, yeah, you're going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg, all right? Um, this this uh, uh, downturn, or more than downturn, crisis, okay, uh, it's bad, but it's not. It, it, it doesn't bring us 
it's, it's something that will, either it is already on the way to being over, or if some people in the honorable panel think that it isn't, uh, but it, it'll blow over, and we will get back to a tremendous prosperity. Um, regulation is important, but not to tell you what the leverage rate is. Yeah. The, the regulatory powers should not say to the banks, you can't have a leverage more than 15%. Or you have to have a down payment of 50%. Or you're not allowed to pay your, your, uh, um, your uh, executives more than so and so many million dollars a month, okay? Uh, you're not, don't tell people how to conduct their business. You tell people how to conduct their business, you're not gonna have business. Okay, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, purposely exaggerating, yeah? But you're not gonna have business. Uh, what is it? There are three important functions for regulation, three. One is transparency, okay? You have to tell the people what the leverage rate is, yeah? If they wanna put their money in a bank, which has a leverage rate of, uh, which has a leverage factor of 60, God bless them, but it's their problem, okay? You have to tell them what the, what the transparency is the most important. Um, who, who was it that, uh, I think Eitan said, clearly the regulation was in the inadequate. CEOs said that they didn't know what's going on. The CEO, was it you who said that? Yeah. The CEO has to know what's going on, and not only the CEO, also the customers of the corporation, they have to know what's going on. Transparency is the most important thing, and that is a legitimate function of regulation. Another legitimate reg function of regulation is, of course, honesty. People have to tell the truth, yes. And, and uh, no shenanigans, that is a, but that, that's more, perhaps more uh, in the district attorney's office and, and they all, for example, no insider trading, okay? In that, that, is, that kind of regulation, that is appropriate. And the last thing is regulation for competition, yes. You have to, the Sherman Antitrust Act and similar things, they have to be enforced. You have to have competition. But beyond those three things, let the market do what it wants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'll take this one. Thank you, uh, Bob. Let me just make one comment on what you say, and then I, I'll, I'll open this issue, which seemed to be more controversial than I thought, uh, for, for discussion. What I, I think one thing that you oversee is the fact that financial market is an environment overlook, which overlook. overlook, sorry. I, overlook. I oversee overlook. it really, yeah, but yeah. you meant overlook. Overlook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that financial market uh, is an environment with uh, lots of externalities. It's not that... Uh, uh, what you do will not affect other people. And this is, this is why uh, it's almost a must to have a certain uh, degree of regulation in this market. You started your answer uh, with, um, uh, with, with uh, an idea that I share as well, which is the role of irrationality in the crisis is, is minimal, is zero, negligible, zero. is negligible. I'm not sure it's zero, but it's definitely negligible. And this is precisely a good reason why you should uh, uh, consider regulation, because regulation are going to be useful to set up incentives correctly. If people are rational, it's, uh, there is a chance that by correcting the, the set of incentives, you'll be able to at least decrease the propensity of such events. I mean, we know that incentives are uh, uh, ill-designed for uh, portfolio managers in the sense that they're being, um, they're being compensated too, uh, too early and only based on their successes, never based on their failures. We know that uh, this creates uh, uh, an, an agency problem between these uh, portfolio managers and the customers. We know that there are ill incentives uh, in, in other places in the market. And, and, and I think that uh, uh, some degree of regulation can improve uh, or, or reduce the chances of, uh, of these uh, crises to return. Uh, uh, Eric, I, 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 yeah. 
I was wondering why Eyal skipped over himself and gave the microphone to me after Eitan. Now I know why. He wanted to have the last word. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate Bob, uh, who, as he acknowledged, knows nothing about economics, but still managed to give us a 15-minute sermon on how <laughs> market should be run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, Al had uh, basically uh, the reaction uh, that I had to. I, 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 I was pretty much on Bob's side for the first ten minutes of his uh, of his speech, uh, but then. Uh, then I think uh, enthusiasm got the better of <laughs> got the better of him. Uh, markets, as we all know, are are powerful engines for prosperity, but not all markets work well, and particularly markets where there are huge externalities, as financial markets suffer from, don't work well entirely on their own, and. Uh, you know, it's not a choice between regulate everything and regulate nothing. There, 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 there's a, a trade-off. You, you, you regulate a bit more, perhaps you won't get so much growth, but you'll get a bit more stability. And uh, I think there's wide acceptance of the, of the uh, fact that this, this past time round, we were perhaps too far out on the uh, instability axis. Uh, uh, given the losses that have been in incurred the last two years, perhaps a somewhat lower growth rate uh, in exchange for higher stability would have been warranted. The only way to get that, because otherwise mar markets will just uh, have their own inertia is th is through is through effective regulation, such as telling banks what their maximum leverage ratio is. Uh, uh, one example, uh, one empirical example is uh, is Canada, a, a, a country which is right next to the United States, shares many things in common with uh, with American markets and which had a uh, pretty tightly regulated banking system, they uh, pretty much withstood this financial crisis without uh, d direct hits. They, they, they didn't have bank failures. Uh, they, they suffered because the US suffered, but that was an indirect effect rather than a direct effect. Growth in Canada was pretty good, so so uh, I, I I think uh, a balance uh, is uh, is what what's called for, and and Canada illustrates perhaps a better balance than what the U.S. Uh, achieved prior to the to this recent crisis. <laughs> okay, you'll have the last word, okay. So a, a couple things. Um, so Bob gave a very vivid and beautiful exposition of the leverage cycle. Uh, he didn't call it that, but that's what it was. And the, the beginning demand by those people in the subprime market, what does that mean? The banker, his banker, if they'd wanted to borrow 20% of the value of a house, at the very beginning, the banker would have said, OK. So what changed was that the banker who would have loaned them $20, he now is willing to loan them 80 or 90 or $97. It's not that, uh, you know, the extra demand, where did it come from? Precisely that leverage went up. Bankers were willing to lend a bigger amount than they were before. And of course, they charged a higher interest too. But the point is, they lent more money than they uh, were willing to, to lend before. And that's why demand 
went up. And as Bob said, if, if they had required 20% down payments or 30% down payments for those people, it, it, it would have been a, a big difference when uh, the crisis began. Those people wouldn't have walked away from their houses. They would have been rational, just as he said, and they would have said, I've got a property that's worth more than what I owe. I'm going to pay it off, or I'm going to sell my house, pay off the loan, and, and, and retain my equity. But because the house went down below what the, was owed, that's why they walked all right away from their houses. Now, the, the end of the levered cycle had more, one more element that Bob didn't emphasize, but I think it, it, it's clear it played an important role. Part of the reason the prices went down in the end was not just because there were these foreclosed houses being put on the market, but the new buyers, including the people who lost their houses, you know, they still exist. Why didn't they go back and buy another house? It's because they couldn't get another loan. So the, the, the prices went so fast down, not just because there were new houses on the market, but because nobody could borrow again. There weren't the same subprime loans being given out at the end as there were in the beginning. So even the people who hadn't defaulted, they couldn't get a loan to get a new house. So the, the increase in demand is very related to the increase in leverage, and the drop in demand, which helped the prices go down, is related to the, uh, the, the, the decrease in leverage. Now, I, it, Bob would have said that if he had an extra second to talk. You know, if he had 20 minutes instead of 15, he would have said that. So that is the leverage cycle. So I agree with everything he said. It's a beautiful exposition of what the uh, problem was and how, how it arose. His conclusion, just like Eric said, I, I'm puzzled by. Because given that it's all the result of rational behavior and it ends up in the prisoner's dilemma-like outcome, why can't we do better by changing the institution and the incentives? So let's, let's just be clear of what the externality is. If I'm underwater, if I owe more than my house is worth, I start to do bad things. First of all, I stop paying. I know it's going to take them a few years to throw me out of my house. So for those years, I'm not paying. I'm not fixing the house. You know, Before I leave in the end, I'm probably going to rip everything I can out of the house, or some vandals next door are going to see that I've left the house empty, and they're going to rip the place apart. The behavior, you know, the behavior changes once you're underwater. So what's the externality? If a bank gives a loan to to me, say, and says, OK, this guy's a, a, a little bit, we know we're taking a bigger risk by putting a 90% you know, loan or 97% loan. We know there's a higher chance of default for this guy. We're going to be compensated by a higher interest rate. There's no externality. The fact that I might default more often, the bank has taken into account. Everybody's rational. It should be fine. But what the bank is not thinking about is that is just Bob's story. When I end up defaulting with a higher probability and I ruin my house and I make the neighborhood more miserable, Eric's house is now going to be worth less. And he took out a loan, too. And now he's going to be underwater. And he's going to say, why should I, just like Bob said, why should I fix my house? It's not worth anything close to what the loan is that I owe. I'm going to start doing the same thing that guy John did. And so that's the externality. So the system, the, the lender and the borrower, they always have this incentive to overloan because they're not taking into account that when things turn bad, third parties are going to be affected. So that's the reason why we have to have limits on leverage. And um, so I want to say one more thing about it. I think the limits on leverage should not just be at the, and it's for the reasons Aton said, not just on the banks. If you tell a bank you can't be leveraged more than 15 to 1 or something, the loans that they make, the way they get leveraged, someone else will start to do them. And then the leverage will go up outside the banking sector somewhere else. So I think it's much more talking too long, sorry, maybe I'm talking too long. I think it's important that we have leverage limited at, uh, so I, I would put, so Stan Fisher is the best example of this. He thought housing, 65%, he said, housing prices are going up too far. You know, in America, nobody did anything about it. 65% loan to value uh, limit. You can't get more than a 65% loan to value loan on a house in Israel now. So that's the kind of thing that I think we, we, uh, we need to do. And, and uh, the, so the, the Fed in the US and many other places should be thinking about loan to value ratios and thinking about limiting them. Of course, it's going to be hard at first and mistakes are going to be made and productivity will decline because they're too stringent at the beginning. But we'll figure out a way to work it out to do as Eric says, get the right balance of safety and reducing externalities, and also promoting growth. I just wanted to, <clears throat> a couple of comments. One is that 
again, your story is one that doesn't explain why it happened now. That's what bothers me. You know, you, you say they always lend, lend more, and they always have this externality. And we have lived 50, 60 years without any problems. I mean, something's got to, yep. that, that's not a plausible story. You got to somehow explain where this sort of injection and volatility was your one no, external I, effect. I, I guess Before, financial innovation. Financial yeah. innovation. But why did they suddenly innovate? Uh, let me just explain. Shadow banking was there since the 40s, and it was the government that first innovated it. I mean, the first steps. So the idea of bundling mortgages together and putting them in a bag was, I believe, uh, first done in the 30s or maybe 40s. I mean, it's an age-old idea. And the tranching is, is not that, uh, that new either, and so on. So, uh, you know, there's got to be some big shock. You, you realize the shadow banking system grew, you know, a thousand percent from 1980 to, to, to uh, say, 2006 or something like that. That's a phenomenal growth. And it's, uh, if your story is that it's coming, you know, from the housing market or, you know, you've got to tell what is the underlying driver that we see this kind of explosion. And I think, I think the answer is uh, not giving away my whole story this afternoon. It's got to be the globalization and the world, you know, money was pushing its way into the United States. It was looking for parking space and it, it, it started in the, in the, you know, when, when you, you can look at the, co you can look at, the, at the, the current account deficit. It's interesting to look at current account deficit grows exactly or is exactly matched basically by the growth in the shadow banking system. The current account deficit is the same as the capital account. Uh, so uh, it's uh, at least on a very gross level, it matches exactly the evidence. They grow almost parallel with each other. So uh, I think that is a very plausible hypothesis. The other thing I wanted to say, we speak as if we know something. Uh, actually, we don't know that much. I think we, we should be more humble. You know, John knows that it is the leverage cycle. Uh, Bob knows that it is something else. I know that it is something else. The truth is we don't really know. You know, and, 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 and the, the final answer may come, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and it's probably going to be like the Great Depression, that the answer is something very different than we, we are thinking right now. So I think it will some. We have to put this in the context, but I, I feel strongly about the fact that any explanation that was good, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it doesn't pass the test for me. You know, the, the, you got to tell some other story. Let me say one more thing. Scandinavia had, just to illustrate my concern about the shadow bank, Scandinavia had a big financial crisis in the 90s, which is actually when I got interested in these problems. Massive crisis and bigger than the, the Great Depression. You know, GDP fell by 15% in Finland. That was more than it fell during the Great Depression. Uh, Sweden had, uh, had a little milder case, but still bad. We, didn't, we have no securitization. We have no shadow banking system. Nor do we have what John emphasizes, uh, which is if you take a loan, you pay it until you die. You, there's no, you know, there's no put or, you, you know, there's no foreclosure where you just walk out of the house if, if, the, if, if you're 150% of the value. So, you know, you have a crisis with completely different institutional settings than you are describing. And, uh, and you know, I, let me say that I resent to some extent Ken Rogoff and Reinhard and Rogoff. You know, this time is different, which they really, the storyline is, of course, that it's always the same, and we are just stupid, you know, over and over again. I think it's like, their book is sort of saying, like, you know, we die because the heart stops beating. You know, it's always the same. The heart stops beating, you know, then we die. That's the cause of the. There can be many reasons why the heart stops beating. And I think, actually, we are looking at the U.S. case. It's very different from the Scandinavian case. Possibly coming out of it is going to be similar, but uh, even that I suspect. So I, I, th I think the, 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 the data is interesting, but the conclusions about, about you know, what, what, uh, that it's always the same, you know, I think, I think that's a dangerous way of thinking about it. And I, I'm afraid my friend here, uh, John, is a little bit liable to the same.
I just want to respond to Bengt, who sort of laid down a challenge here of what was different uh, this time. So Bengt's explanation is that uh, Chinese lending was what was different. The Chinese made us do it. That, that's his explanation, the global imbalances. So I, I think that uh, a, a, a more important explanation comes from this leverage, which comes from financial innovation like securitization. So all through the 90s, the same, you know, trillions of dollars of securitizations were being created that were never there before. And all through the 2000s, there's a gigantic amount of that financial innovation. Subprime lending was not done by the banker that Bob was talking about. That banker knew he could sell the package into uh, a securitization. So the innovation was the, sec was the securitization which enabled the increase in leverage. And as I said, the reason is always you want to stretch the collateral. So why is it that this happened in the 90s and 2000 and not before, this, this complicated packaging of things? Well, you know, it's hard to get to the very bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a secret conversation? Well, <laughs> so you better learn Hebrew. <laughs> I've been, uh, it's the language of the future. Yeah, you may be Not right. only of the past, but also, <laughs> also the future. future. <laughs> All right. So, just, so securitization. I think Bank touched on some important ideas here. That the big push. The big push, you're welcome, Bank. The big push, and, and I don't even think you're dangerous, or do it, nor do I to resent you. So I think the big push is that um, the government made a big push in pushing securitization. The original pooled loans of Fannie and Freddie were all guaranteed by the government. They wouldn't have happened if the government hadn't guaranteed it. And then Fannie and Freddie guaranteed their own loans, by the way, not just the securitizations, but Fannie and Freddie as organizations were implicitly guaranteed by the government. That had a huge impetus to, to it, start? it started in the 80s and this had a huge impetus Why in, did it in the 2008? okay because once they got the idea of securitizing CMOs which I actually participated in that was a very good idea then you know after that whole apparatus was set up it became easier to think of securitizing subprime mortgages they couldn't have done that 20 years before without all the apparatus that was set up so you know why does somebody invent a new drug it's not obvious how that happens if you want to explain that you know all right all right in any case you can't explain everything I just want to pick up on on, on something that that Bank said, uh, which I agree with in part. Uh, he he said that that uh, uh, economists have to be humble and and acknowledge that they. Uh, don't really know what exactly what happened this time around, and I and I and I agree with that. Uh, in fact, that's been reflected in in this summer school where we've had you know eight different theories or eight different possible mechanisms for how uh, something like the the great financial crisis could come about. But that doesn't mean that economists don't know anything. I, I, in, fa in fact, I think the summer school also proves that we, we know a great deal uh, about uh, the, 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 the general picture of uh, a financial crisis, the sense in which there is uh, a family resemblance about most financial crises. And it, we also know uh, from from these various theories, what the, what the general preventative steps ought to be, such, such as lim limiting leverage and imposing minimum loan standards. So let me, let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, okay. You want to say something? Huh? I yield to the distinguished speaker. You complain okay. about me talking about 10 minutes. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I promise not to speak after you, not on this issue, please. <laughs> on which issue you want to speak? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, okay, short, very good. 
Okay, we'll try to make it uh, two minutes. Okay, one thing, uh, Eyal, in responding to my remarks, talked about compensation, and this is really very important. It's an important uh, element of, um, of uh, providing the right incentives. Now, uh, um, executives have been uh, traditionally compensated by ordinary salary and uh, options. Okay, options are the wrong compensation because options says heads you w he heads I win, tails nothing. I don't lose. Okay, when 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 uh, when the stock goes up, I cash in. When the stock goes down, garnished nothing. Yes, uh, nothing happened. I don't lose because I simply don't exercise the option. That's the wrong way of doing things. The right way of doing things is by vested stock. Stock that you cannot stock, not options, but the stock of the company, which you cannot, uh, uh, um, within a matter of two, three, four, five years, you can't cash. Yeah, you can't sell. You're not allowed to sell, the, because then you, your pocket goes like the company's pocket. Okay, but even that should not be. Regulated, yes. In other words, the, the, every company should be allowed to compensate its executives the way it wants. It should be transparent. In other words, it, the, the company should have to say in, in, in uh, uh, 10 point, uh, or no, in 20 point letters, we compensate by stock, we compensate by options, whatever it is, they should be allowed. And similarly, with all, with all regulations, the regulation should be, should provide incentives, just like young Professor Ginnacopoulos said. Look, he still has black hair. He's the only one here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, it, 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 should, it should provide incentives, but it should not give absolute limits. In other words, you can say to a company, look, if you want to give a, a uh, 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 if you want to have a leverage rate of 60 to 1, God bless you, be my guest, but tell your depositors that you have 60 to 1 and we're not going to, uh, we're not going to insure your deposits. Or will you, we'll insure your deposit at a much lower rate, yeah, something like that. Give incentives, but not regularly. Thank you. Okay, then you answer. Yes. Not ignorance, no, information, that's what I say. Okay. Transparency, transparency. Okay. Regulate for transparency, but not regulate, not, not give cash. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll take just one short question from the public, we'll, and uh, uh, we'll close it. Yes. I go back to Professor Armstrong's uh, point that uh, I hear why uh, many why the mechanism or the institution failed, and it reminds me in the last fire, in the Carmel fire, when a fireman was asked, and I said every fire starts with a small fire. Before being a huge fire, it was a small fire, and the institutions and the mechanisms are able to control certain uh, sizes of, of of fires. When, when, it get, when it gets out of control, then you get a crisis. And, the, and here, the point is the fuel of the fire. And when I, the idea that I think that is in line with the, of the Professor Rahul Rajan, that, uh, that explains uh, about the, the model of the export economy, that they don't have a domestic, strong domestic consumption, and so they rely the, the strong growth, the fast growth by parking their money or by investing they, they are forced to invest, to invest some, and then that, that is the question that maybe could explain why now and not before. Because as, as you, all of, all of you detailed, uh, gave, gave in detail about the mechanism, the incentives, or, or, the, or why the institution fails, they, I, I think that we should go back to that question, and why now, and my, my question to you, because I just only read those papers of uh, Rajan, and I think that you were the one who, who, who got close to this, do you think, uh, going a little bit farther, not maybe on the direction that you're going to do in the next, in the third lecture, but on the other direction of why is this at, the, at this moment that uh, those strong, huge, huge 
capital flows demanded for those assets that they were not. There were not enough houses to, to back those, those loans. So we have to leverage more in order to, to create those assets because we need to, to respond to the supply, the, to the demand that we have of those funds that they're looking for a place to, to, to park. The, the question is, do you think, I don't, I, I didn't sit, I'm, I'm very anxious to see the lecture that you're going to lecture on, and, and, but, but still, but, but still I would like to know if you think that it's, uh, that, it's a good <laughs> that this, this, this idea that, uh, that it's, it's been, that the, the answer to the question now is because the world is not only the western part of the world, but also the eastern part of the world, and, and we, we were influenced by 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 the, by that by the other part of the world. Yeah, I leave it to the lecture. Let me just say <laughs> one thing: it's not just why now. The big question is also why the U.S. I mean, why the U.S. You know, why did you start here? You know, so well, so you have to go to the lecture and get answers to all these questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to close here, and you all, of course, invited to bank uh, talk uh, this afternoon. <laughs>